All right, tonight it is all things Nittany Lions. Grab a drink and join us on this week's tailgate. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we've got another episode of the tailgate. As always, I am Luke. I'm Dennis. <laughs> and I'm Michael. And tonight we are joined by uh, Matt Flip, who is uh, one of the podcasters from Roar Lions Roar. And he's going to come talk to us about some Penn State football today. Uh, Matt, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, fellas. Uh, always good this time of year. Spring ball for Penn State ends on Saturday with the spring game. So it's the last hurdle before we get into probably the most exciting part of the offseason, that uh, that second spring transfer window when you find out who really has an NIL bag. Yeah, who who uh, who from Penn State is looking like they might be uh, heading out from that NIL, that spring NIL? Or spring the, transfer portal. The NIL thing's kind of kind of tough to read. So no matter what happens, the spring transfer portal is going to hit Penn State. Not hard, but at least uh, if my math is right, like ten percent of the roster has to go in to get them under that eighty-five scholarship limit. They didn't really lose a lot of guys in the transfer portal after the season. The only scholarship guys with eligibility left that that headed out was the backup punter. Uh, Christian Driver, son of uh, Packers legend Donald Driver, went off to Minnesota. Um, Jordan Vandenberg, a backup defensive tackle, uh, headed out towards Georgia Tech. Uh, and those are the real big – Dante Cephas went to Kansas State. That was a, a pretty big one. But other than that, they did a really good job keeping that roster in check, and they did a surprisingly good job getting a couple guys to stick around for that fifth and sixth COVID years, which I was surprised by. Yeah, and not only that, but they had some pretty good transfers come in, too. Um, obviously, I'm an Ohio State fan, so yep. you got one of my favorite receivers, uh, Fleming. Came yep. Over. I think he's going to make a great addition for y'all. And then you got some uh, cornerbacks from, like, Georgia and Florida, correct? Yeah, A.J. Harris uh, out of Georgia, a former five-star recruit uh, coming in. I, I really do think that this is a perfect match because Penn State's losing their three starting corners from last year. So a ton of reps up for grabs. And then Jalen Kimber from Florida, who also, funnily enough, started his career at Georgia. So you're bringing in those two guys to really try to rebuild a room um, that to this day, uh, we a lot of us thought Joey Porter Jr. would be it. More of us thought Kalen King would be it. But a Penn State defensive back has never been taken in the first round of the draft. So we're always looking for whoever that first guy might be. I don't know if it's going to be either of those two, but it's always good when you can get a former five star and, and a guy with a ton of SEC experience into your program. Yeah, that's definitely going to help out a whole lot. And then uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong here. You guys are losing 10 starters, correct? That sounds about right. Uh, on the offensive line, you're losing three guys, both tackles and your center. Uh, wide receiver, uh, it depends on what you want to call a starter, <laughs> that, but that was a revolving door to say the least. Uh, and, then, and then a tight end, Theo Johnson's off to the pros. I think he's, he's going to go higher uh, than I think his production would lead some people to believe. Uh, I think a big reason for that is, uh, is uh, the reason Mike Yersich uh, was let go after the, uh, the Michigan game this past fall. And then defensively, I mean, Chop Robinson, Kalen King, Johnny Dixon, and Daquan Hardy, a lot of guys heading out the door. Uh, but, you know, they, they've stocked the room really well. And that's the thing that I think has a lot of fans excited, especially on that defense. Last year's defense was the best Penn State defense, frankly, I've ever seen. Uh, and they really wasted it with a pretty underwhelming offense, to say the least. So we're, uh, we're excited to see how they reload here. So I guess uh, with reloading of the defense, are you concerned basically losing your defense coordinator from last year with Manny Diaz? So the Manny Diaz thing always felt like a, not a marriage of convenience, but I think a lot of people really understood that he wasn't long for Happy Valley. Like I don't know if you all have ever been to State College. Uh, it's cold. It's cold and it's cold and it's rainy pretty much 100 and something days a year. It's miserable. So to look at Manny Diaz and prior to that, I think the furthest, furthest north he ever coached was Middle Tennessee State. Uh, so I think it was a bit of a culture shock. Uh, and I didn't expect him to stay long for that weather. Uh, and obviously losing Manny is, is, a, is a major blow. I think he really was that head coach of the defense. And they really played an attacking style, man. They got after quarterbacks. I think they were top five in the country in sacks each of the last two years. They may have led it in sacks last year. Uh, Big 
Lake Park, thank, thanks to Chop Robinson and, and Adisa Isaac, two guys out the door. Uh, but with Tom Allen coming in, James Franklin always spoke very highly of Tom Allen. Tom Allen in Indiana beat Penn State back in 2020. They almost beat him. They should have beat him this past fall. So to bring in Tom Allen, a guy a lot of players seem to like playing for, I think is a really natural fit. And again, even from like the uh, the Brent Pry years to the Manny Diaz years and now into the Tom Allen era, Franklin defense has always really been a 4-3. I think they'll go a little more 4-2-5 this year because Tom Allen likes that extra safety. But the base of it should stay mostly intact. But it, naturally, there's going to be some kind of regression to the mean after losing what I think was the best defensive coordinator in the Big Ten last year yeah I would not argue with that at all um now I've got to ask about James Franklin because from down here in Nashville being an Ohio mm-hmm. fan obviously James Franklin you know did some great job he did a great job at the you know schools beforehand he mm-hmm. at Penn State and I feel from what I hear that there's kind of a tear down the middle in Penn State fans you have a group that kind of sees him as like give him time he's he's doing mm-hmm. great we want to keep rolling with him and then another side who's going, he should be doing better than this. We expect more. So what are you, what are you kind of, where are you in that yeah. scenario and what are you hearing about that? So I think there's really three buckets here to what the Penn State fan base thinks about James Franklin. Uh, the, the bucket I'm in is that Penn State traditionally is about a nine and three program. They last won a natty over four, like about 40 years ago. Like, you know, the idea that that's something that they're going to be able to do year in and year out is really an old guard kind of mentality. I, I really don't believe that's what Penn State is in modern football. So I see, you know, a ton of 10 win seasons. I see consistently recruiting in the top 15. That for me feels about right for what Penn State should be in 2024. Uh, with that being said, with how talented the roster is, it is pretty frustrating that they're currently in the middle of the longest uh, losing streak to Ohio State since they joined the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. That's hard. You know, it's hard to balance those two things where you see what the program was when he took over. You see him get the win in 2016. You see him almost get a win again in 17, almost get a win in 18. Uh, and then from there, it really just feels like the uh, older brother, you know, putting his arm out and keeping the younger brother away. Um, and again, they have to get over that hump, I think, sooner or later. Like, listen, I, I don't think it's too much to ask for a guy like James Franklin to beat Ohio State, you know, two times in 10 years, three times in 10 years. That feels about right for what Penn State is. So that's... You know, a few times themselves versus other teams. So That's true. That's a, that's a good... You know, you <laughs> That's a good listen. Those Missouri Tigers are causing trouble for me here, too. I get you. Uh, and then there's the other camp that I'll put I'll put some folks in in that they think Penn State is still what it should have been in 1986. And again, that is a very loud portion of the fan base. That's a fan base that has a lot of the money to give to Penn State, especially in the modern era where you got to give money if you're going to hang on to your players, if you're going to compete. So to watch them kind of conflict and see, you know, half the folks say, well, he's not winning natties, you know, let's get him out of here. And then the other half saying, all right, like no one else did for about 40 years anyway. What are we talking about? You know, do you not remember the early 2000s? So that's where I think that a lot of the disconnect happens. And then there's the other section, which are people from Philly and Pittsburgh who are huge NFL fans and think if you're not winning every year, you're a loser. So you have that you have that segment, too. Mm-hmm. So what uh, what's the big news coming out uh, Penn State right now? Like I know you guys are obviously you're just like a lot of programs doing the doing all the spring camp stuff and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But what's like what are some of the big big kind of buckets or big news that are like that, that are just kind of hitting your that hitting your feed that you guys mm-hmm. are aware of that especially being a part like more in the culture there. So the big one is uh, probably a lack of news that no wide receiver is stepping up, which is terrifying, uh, considering the fact that Penn State brought in Dante Cephas last year, a Pittsburgh native, was really productive at Kent State. He came in. He didn't get to campus in time for spring, missed spring ball, uh, and really, it was clear, didn't know the playbook. More often than not, not more often than not, but a noticeable amount of times uh, he was blocking downfield when he was clearly the primary read. And that's that's frustrating to watch. Um, and, and it's a lot of the same now. And, and I'm glad you called out Julian Fleming. It, it's his it's his fifth year. He's a Catawissa PA native. And, and that's really close to State College in central Pennsylvania. That was a guy Penn State really thought they had to get, you know, when he was coming out of high school. And at this point of his career, I think the biggest thing he can give Penn State is be a guy who is 
you know, cut his teeth in the best receiver room in college football in Ohio State and bring some of that energy to State College. So we're hoping that we're hoping that it, re- that it leads to that. Uh, and again, after uh, after the summer enrollees get here, there's going to be 15 scholarship receivers, at least as things stand right now. I do think a lot of guys are going to hit the portal here in a couple weeks. Uh, but that's the big concern right now. And then how does everybody fit in to Andy Kotelnicki, the new offensive coordinator, into his offense? He's a guy who really did a lot with not a lot at Buffalo and at Kansas. You know, the reigning, I think he was 24-7 Sports' offensive coordinator of the year, did a lot of stuff with two quarterbacks, Jalen Daniels, Jason Bean, both phenomenal to watch. Like, I'd be, I'd be blessed to have either of those two quarterback in my offense. So, a lot of us are just really curious to see what the offense looks like under Kodal Nicky. If it's going to have to be, you know, two of your three best receivers are tight ends again. Uh, and really, what can they get out of the ground game explosive wise that they just lacked for pretty much all last year? Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if they're able to get the run game going on, I feel like it'd be a great bit benefit to them just because, I mean, you have a lot of high powered offenses in the Big Ten right now with the mm-hmm. game, you can control the time. Mm-hmm. They able to kind of get anywhere close to their defense of last year, they could be a real problem, especially with the new teams from like UCLA, U, uh, USC, Washington. I don't know how much they're going to be able to be back, but yeah, Penn State could definitely kind of control uh, the conference pretty well from there. I like how you and a lot of UCLA and Washington, but you forget to mention Oregon. <laughs> Listen, well, UCLA and Washington are both on the schedule. Thank- thankfully, we dodge Oregon. Okay, man, right. you got to know this stuff. Right. <laughs> I got you. I got you. <laughs> And I will say the, the good thing about that running game is Nick Singleton and Katron Allen, they're both back. Those guys are, are it's probably going to be their last year. Very rarely, unless you're Michigan, and you can just drop an NIL bag for Blake Corum. You're not going to stay as a running back for that long uh, here in college. So I expect it to be those both of those guys last year and to watch them grow. You know, they're they're both Sunday players. That's clear. And to be able to hang on to them in this era and have them both understand that neither of them was ever going to be the lead dog in that pack. And for them to both stay, both improve, I am really expecting a pretty big year out of both of those guys, especially in, you know, Kotal Nicky's run heavy offense. Especially if they can get their line going and get those three replacements going good. Mm -hmm. I feel like Penn State always has a good line, but I'm really curious to see how Allen is going to perform this upcoming season. I feel like he actually did really well last year. Yeah, he was their best running back far and away. He's, he's such a natural receiver, too. I mean, he played at IMG Academy. I hate to say it. Those guys prep you a little better uh, than the Reading, Pennsylvania high schools do to play at, to play at this level. So you could tell he came in ready to go. Sure. Um, now, you did mention, and I agree with you 100 percent, the the close calls that Ohio State had against Penn State. Um, mm-hmm. the, the reason I bring that up is Penn I State to, to me. Ohio State win. I do want to say Ohio State all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I I really enjoy the Penn State games. Every time mm-hmm. I play Penn State, I look forward to it. I always have that little heart murmur that happens during you know before and, and during the game. Um, but I don't know if you've seen the protected games that the Big Ten came mm-hmm. out. Did you see that? Mm-hmm. So yep. I was very shocked and surprised that Penn State did not have a protected game, and I was really hoping that that protected game would be against Ohio State because I really yep. enjoy that game. What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any insight, maybe you, what you think, why they did not protect any game? Um, so, yeah. Uh, well, uh, for starters, uh, when Penn State joined the Big Ten, they're kind of the ones that kicked off this realignment fest 30 years ago. Like, it, it really did start with Penn State opting not to form a conference with Pitt, Syracuse, West Virginia, those traditional Penn State rivals that the generation before me really takes a lot of value in. And listen, the Penn State pick games when I was in college were great. The West Virginia rivalry being renewed these past two years. They start the season in Morgantown this year. That's been great. It's just hard for a team like Penn State to find that natural rival in the Big Ten. Michigan's always going to have Ohio State. Mm -hmm. The next natural one is, is I guess, like Maryland or Rutgers. And Penn State fans don't want it to be Maryland and Rutgers because there's not that history of those. I don't want to call them lower power five teams, but, you know, for lack of a better term, lower power five teams. So I kind of like it. I, I really think it's neat that Penn State gets to kind of just go out on their own and every year the schedule can look a little bit different. You know, Penn State always is the kind of place that's going to draw fans no matter where they are. And listen, if you tell me you can get out of Pennsylvania and go to LA in October, I think everyone's going to take advantage of that, you know, a couple of times, a couple of times a decade. 
<laughs> yeah, you can't argue with that. Oh, my God. So on that note, though, is there a particular team, especially with all the new teams joining the Big Ten, that you may think may become like your new rival? Like, Oh, that's, that's, I mean, the, the natural the one I always thought of was USC because that one is the all, oh, I think that's one of like the few programs that still do the no names in the back of the jersey. Sure. So there's still that natural connection. You know, Penn State, Oregon played in a Rose Bowl many, many moons ago. Washington comes to town. We played them in the Fiesta Bowl back in 2017. That was a great game. The USC one feels natural, but again, USC is going to have Notre Dame. USC is going to have UCLA, you know, and, and that's the frustrating part for the Penn State fan in me in that there is no natural rival for Penn State that is clearly everybody else's primary rival. Uh, and everyone's going to own up to it because even even Pitt and West Virginia have each other for the backyard brawl. Mm-hmm. So there's just really a uh, they're kind of wandering, uh, wandering the desert solo here. And it's uh, it's kind of unfortunate. They tried to do a thing with Michigan State where they would have like a competing blood drive on campus every year. And they play for like a gross trophy, the land grant trophy. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It looks, it looks disgusting. If you get a chance, it looks like a five-year-old built it. It's hilarious. Uh, and, and that's the big one that they go with. Um, and it, I'll be honest, I am bummed that that trophy is going away. Cause there's a lot of really funny bits with the land grant trophy, uh, like in Penn state and Michigan state Twitter. Uh, but thankfully Penn state won that last one this year. So the land grant trophy, uh, stays home this fall. Fair enough. Oh yeah, that 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 is pretty funny looking. Uh, oh, you pull it up on your computer. Yeah, I pulled it up. So it's pretty it's pretty gross. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely can agree with you. So it's yeah, pretty nasty. I mean, but the blood, <laughs> that's a really cool thing to do. Like even if yeah, the trophy's not the best thing to look at. The the reason behind it sure. is pretty nice. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, they're always trying to find new ways. Fair enough. Uh, so what do, what do you think is going to be uh, y'all's? Uh, like your y'all schedule at the end of this year. Like, what's your what do you think is going to be your record? Like at the end of the schedule for this year. Like, just if you were to make your homework pick, or I mean, you can be realistic if you want to. I mean, it, like, I was really high on Penn State last year. I thought oh, brother, be- you and me both. Dark you should have beaten Ohio State again. Should have, should have, absolutely, absolutely, they should have had it. Um, and and I think a big reason, you know, they won ten games last year and they fired their OC mid season. If that doesn't tell you the disappointment that that ten win season had, I don't know what else can. Um, so the way I describe Penn State, and, and it causes a lot of rifts, even just within the people on our podcast, in that. I call Penn State a window program, and what that means is about two years every decade. That's your window. That's when your roster is built up. That's your best shot, I think, to do more than that nine and three, 10 and two area you exist in. I thought 2023 would have been a window. They choked it. And as a result, again, Yurcich got fired midseason, which is crazy to think about. Franklin's never done that before. Now, I think with the with the playoff expanding, I think that a lot of pressure goes off James Franklin and that coaching staff in big games. Will they still turtle up? I have a lot of evidence that says yes. Um, But at the same time, I do feel good about this team getting to 10 wins again. I think dodging Michigan, even though I think Michigan is going to be not nearly the juggernaut they've been the last couple of years. Uh, But going, you know, your road opponents are USC, who... I don't think that defense can get fixed in a year and are replacing a generational talent in Caleb Williams. You're going to Minnesota. You're going to Wisconsin. Um, that's like the big ones for you. You get Ohio State at home. Uh, you get UCLA at home. You're going out to USC. You know, you go to West Virginia to start the year. You got a couple of MAC games in there. The schedule just really lines up for you to get to 10 wins. And I, and I really do think getting through West Virginia at first, who gave them Penn State a fit for that first half last year. If they can get over that, that first hurdle, I think they have a really good shot to get into the playoff in the first year of 12. Fair enough. Yeah, I can see that. I can see. So, I, I, like, again, it's one of those things. Like, I feel like y'all are, y'all are stacked enough with how much returning production, which again, you had a lot of returning production last year too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Returning production you got this year. Like, and the fact that the, the big 10 really is going to look a lot different this next year. Oh, for sure. It's, you know, it's there's there's a there's a there's about five or six teams in the Big Ten that can easily make the playoffs. And I think they're really going to take advantage of that product. They're moving Abdul Carter, who was first team all Big Ten as a linebacker last year. They moved him to defensive end. It was the original plan for Micah Parsons all those years ago. So 
they moved him up. They moved him up this spring. Again, you're losing Chop Robinson. You're just you're losing Adisa Isaac. Those are two Sunday players. There's a lot of really good depth in that linebacker room. Um, at the top of it, I should say, say the younger guys are pretty unproven. But especially if Tom Allen goes with that four two five, you're going to be taking a linebacker off the field anyway. And you want to keep Abdul Carter on the field and to watch him um, <laughs> not drop in coverage and just do what he does best every play is uh, is going to be exciting. Yeah, I think that's more of a natural position for him. So I'm excited to hear mm-hmm. that's what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, they, that's long overdue. Agreed. Well, cool. Well, Matt, we definitely appreciate you having on, having a, appreciate you being on <laughs> with us. Uh, do you want to shout out, give us your Twitter, your YouTube, all that good stuff? Yeah, you can find us on Twitter over at RLR blog on Twitter. Uh, we're on YouTube. We're going to post mostly during the season. Uh, our YouTube guy coaches baseball in the spring, so he's out of commission for a lot of these, but we'll be back up and posting there. Uh, you can find the podcast on your podcast platform of choice. Uh, during the season, we're at least two episodes a week. Right now in the off season, we're a bit more infrequently just based upon our schedules, but we try to get a couple out a month. Uh, but once the season ramps, ramps up uh, from August 1 through bowl season we're in your feeds at least twice a week uh for that whole run and it's uh it's a blast awesome well we're looking forward to seeing how penn state does hopefully they uh they do really well except against ohio state <laughs> i feel like this listen it, is a, you know the window you were talking about i feel like mm-hmm. penn state's had a moment it could happen yeah hey it's drew aller's moment man if he wants to be that nfl uh sunday player this is the time to prove it yeah this is the step he needs to take this is it 100 mm-hmm. percent well, again, thanks for joining us, and again, we, we hope you guys all the success in your uh, this upcoming season, and we hope to have you on later in the season. Hope to be there. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate y'all. All right, we'll see you later. All right, have a good one. Thank you.